Um, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's uh, with great pleasure uh, that I welcome you to tonight's uh, Mackenzie Stewart Lecture, the annual lecture of the Centre for European Legal Studies here in the Faculty of Law at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm Kenneth Armstrong. I'm uh, Director of Cells and uh, Professor of European Law uh, in the University. And it is particularly good to see you uh, all here tonight on what has been a rather cold start to spring. Um, I think some accuse you of being snowflakes, uh, but I think we can safely say that we've left the, the snowflakes outside uh, this evening. Tonight's lecture is the 21st lecture to be given in a series that is organised in honour of Lord Mackenzie Stewart, uh, the UK's first judge uh, to be appointed to the, the European Court of Justice. Now, Lord Mackenzie Stewart went on to be the, the president of, of the court. And this lecture, I think, uh, this lecture series is, is a fitting tribute um, to all the UK judges, the lawyers and civil servants who, since 1973, uh, have played leading roles in shaping uh, the political and judicial institutions of, of the European Union. Now, the lecture series is generally supported by Sherman and Sterling, and Sales is grateful to be able to partner with them uh, in organising uh, tonight's event. Now, our speaker this evening is the Right Honourable uh, Dominic Grieve, QCMP, and he'll be known to everyone uh, in this room, although perhaps for, for somewhat different reasons. Um, he was called to the bar in, in 1980, and was appointed QC in 2008. And in between, he was elected to Parliament in 1997 for the constituency of Beaconsfield. And in opposition, he served as Shadow Attorney General, Shadow Home Secretary, and Shadow Justice Secretary. Of course, under the coalition government, he was appointed uh, Attorney General and served in that role until July 2014. But I think it is perhaps his life outside of shadow cabinet and cabinet um, which has given uh, Dominic Grieva a, a heightened profile in recent months, it's fair to say. Uh, his amendment to the European Union uh, withdrawal bill is significant for, for two reasons. Firstly, that any amendment made it onto the face of the bill in the first place, uh, no mean feat. And secondly, because of its aim to give Parliament a legislative role in the approval of any final withdrawal uh, agreement. Now, whether we will actually get an agreement on a withdrawal uh, may, however, turn out to be more difficult uh, than we might have thought, and certainly following uh, this week's publication of the EU's draft uh, of that agreement. But our topic tonight isn't the usual stuff of Brexit in the sense of the usual chatter about regulations, financial contributions, institutions and procedures. Rather, the, the protection of human rights in the UK has been a, protect, a, a preoccupation of, of Dominic Grieve beyond the boundaries of Brexit. Nonetheless, Brexit and the forces that are driving it do lead us back to important questions about what the protection of human rights looks like in a democracy that seems intent on going alone in the world and doing so in the name of sovereignty. So tonight's lecture is entitled, What Price Sovereignty, Brexit and Human Rights? So on behalf of the Centre for European Legal Studies, I now invite Dominic Grieve to give the 2018 Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm most grateful for the kind invitation that's been extended to me tonight to give this talk. And it's a particular privilege that its name reflects the undoubtedly outstanding contribution Lord Mackenzie Stewart made to the development of EU law and the work of the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. I think probably as a Scots lawyer, he was ideally placed to bring the breadth of the United Kingdom's legal traditions uh, to the development of EU law. And in helping facilitate the court's jurisprudence on mark things like market regulation and fair competition, he was striving to ensure that the principle of cross-frontier freedom to trade and work, which of course underpins the EU, would operate in practice 
as well as in theory. And his election as president of the court at a time when it was actually under a great deal of pressure, I think reflected on his abilities and the respect in which our, both he and our national contribution was held. So I do wonder what he would have made of the circumstances in which we find ourselves today. I have to say it's with sadness that I contemplate the events that form the background against which this lecture is taking place. If all goes according to the government's plan, then by this time next year, our participation in the development of the Europe of European Union law will be approaching its end. Some, like my colleague Boris Johnson, will welcome this as the necessary step to restoring parliamentary sovereignty and nationhood. It was he who described the referendum result as our Independence Day. But others, including myself, will not. To my amusement, I found that my concerns as to what's happening and my response to them in Parliament have been earning me as an ex-Attorney General the labels Rebel Commander and the bespectacled Che Guevara. <laughs> and if that's really what I have indeed become, then this talk at least offers me a moment of reflection as to how I've got there and why I consider that we're at risk of losing far more than we will gain from leaving the EU. There's of course nothing settled about Brexit on which to base some definitive commentary or opinion. Its final form remains unclear. For 20 months now, we've seen the development of an unparalleled political and constitutional crisis for our country. It's precipitated the fall of one government, contributed last June to the failure of another to get a coherent mandate for carrying it out. It divides families, friends, generations and political parties. It's breaking apart the previous broad consensus between the mainstream political parties as to how the economy should continue to be managed. This can be seen in the demand for a return to socialism in large sections of the Labour Voluntary Party and in the differences of view about free market economics amongst Brexit supporting Conservatives. All facilitated by the prospect of the removal of the existing EU legal framework. Look at what Jeremy Corbyn had to say about that this week. Meanwhile, like most revolutionary upheavals, it's bringing economic uncertainty in its wake. And it's also accompanied by a crisis of confidence in our political institutions. The public are showing an increasing dissatisfaction with the way our politics are being conducted. There are serious disagreements still being played out at present as to the respective roles that Parliament and the Executive should perform in authorising and carrying out the Brexit process, and we've had the vitriolic abuse heaped on members of the judiciary for ruling on part of this issue in the Miller case. It also threatens the unity of our country because of divergent views in different parts of the United Kingdom as to how we should best proceed. Now, I mention all these issues because they emphasise for me how the future of human rights after Brexit, on which I do want to concentrate this evening, simply can't be isolated from the wider issues and extraordinary times in which we're living. Brexit constitutes a potentially profound change in our country's relationship with both our own and the international legal order, with consequences that may flow from this both domestically and internationally. In voting to leave the EU, the majority, in its repeated mantra of taking back control, was making some form of demand of the government for a change in direction for the United Kingdom in respect of our country's participation in building supranational legal frameworks and our willingness to be bound by them. The referendum was also a demand concerning what's expected of our unwritten constitution, which has become heavily entwined with the supranational frameworks the United Kingdom has helped to build. It's because Brexit has the capacity to affect so many aspects of our national life that I thought it might be worthwhile giving this topic some consideration in the context particularly of human rights. But I do want to emphasise that this is a politician's view of evolving issues, not an academic's analysis. I also want to look at how these matters are being played out at present in the debate taking place 
in Parliament. It's an interesting feature of our current debate on the future direction our country should take that when you leave aside the arguments about the economy, freedom of movement, immigration, there is actually one thing on which most participants agree, namely the importance of law for our country in reflecting, developing and protecting our national identity and our well-being. My Brexit-supporting colleagues, having differing degrees, signed up to the view that EU membership undermines the sovereignty of Parliament in a manner which is damaging to our independence, parliamentary democracy and our system of law. It fits in with a national, if probably principally English, narrative that can be traced back to Magna Carta, habeas corpus and the Bill of Rights of 1689. It emphasises the exceptionalism of our national tradition, which we can undoubtedly see recognised from a very early date. In the mid-15th century, we have it celebrated by Chief Justice Fortescue in his De Laudibus Legum Angliae, written in 1453. Use of torture is deprecated, trial by jury and due process praised, and with it the uniqueness and its uniqueness to England. There's even, in fact, an excellent section in it which I suggested in parliamentary debate might be relevant to who had the power to trigger Article 50. The King of England, he said, cannot alter nor change the laws of his realm at his pleasure. But it took a court case to sort that out. And of course, to this we can add the case of proclamations of 1610, in which Sir Edward Cook repeated what Fortescue had actually said 150 years earlier. Petition of Right of 1628, the commentaries of William Blackstone, Lord Mansfield's ruling in Somerset's case. This national narrative has proved, and is still proving at times, very important. It continues to act as an effective restraint on British governments trying to curb freedom when tempted to do so by threats to public order or national security. We saw that over 90 and 42-day pre-charge detention just a decade ago under the last Labour government. And, of course, it places Parliament as the central bastion of our liberties. The trouble is that this comforting political tradition is not necessarily supported by a detailed study of our history. It's possible to find periods and instances when its norms have not been observed, from Northern Ireland to Kenya or Malaysia. It's also been used to support opinions that are far less helpful to the rule of law as Lord Bingham defined it in his eight principles, which he expounded in his 2006 lecture. For parliamentary sovereignty can also be used merely as an assertion of power, particularly when the executive has effective control over parliament. In theory, at least, our constitution is that the Queen, acting with the assent of her Lords and Commons, enjoys an exercise of power unlimited by any other lawful authority, what the late Lord Hailsham characterised as its capacity for creating elected dictatorship. And it's, after all, what allowed Henry VIII in his Act of Supremacy of 1534 to use parliamentary authority to coerce his subjects on matters of deepest conscience and, in the last century, enabled the authorisation of detention without charge under the Defence of the Realm Act in wartime. Our EU membership, however, provides an example of how over more recent British history, but particularly since the end of the Second World War, we've embarked on policies that have developed and changed our laws, not just through domestic mechanisms, but through international engagement. Notwithstanding our pride in our national sovereignty, Successive British governments in the last two centuries have sought to make the world a better, safer and more predictable place by encouraging the creation of international agreements governing the behaviour of states. When I was Attorney General, I once asked the Foreign Office to tell me as to how many we were signed up. They were very reluctant to provide me with a figure and finally said they refused to go back beyond 1834. But since that date... They had records of over 13,200 then, I think the figure's actually gone up to about 13,500, that the UK had signed and ratified. And most of those were still applicable and ranged in importance from the United Nations Charter to local treaties over maritime access and fishing rights. Over 700 
contained references to binding dispute settlement through arbitration by a court or tribunal in the event of disagreements over interpretation. And with the passing years, these treaties, be they the UN Convention on the Prohibition of Torture, the creation of the International Criminal Court, have been dealing not just with interstate relations, but with the conduct of states towards those subjects over which they exercise power. Now, so important has been this treaty making that the ministerial code until 2015 referred specifically to the duty of civil servants and ministers to respect our international legal obligations at all times. This was then deleted by the then Prime Minister David Cameron, probably in reaction to being reminded of this point too often and probably by a me. But the deletion could only be cosmetic in its effect. The Cabinet Office had immediately to admit when the deletion was announced that it made no, absolutely no difference whatsoever to the obligation. Of course, it's one of Lord Bingham's eighth principle of the rule of law. If it were abandoned, we would be sanctioning anarchy on the international stage. In fairness, successive UK governments have, despite some lapses, been pretty consistent in observing its principles. Where, after all, still in the midst of the commemorations of the First World War, which we entered explicitly to honour an international treaty obligation to guarantee Belgian neutrality, what the then German <coughs> Chancellor was happy to describe as a scrap of paper. But that's not prevented us agonising and complaining over its impact, particularly in areas where it places constraints on the United Kingdom's power to legislate at will on domestic matters. Now, I don't want to get too diverted this evening by the history of our adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights and its incorporation into our law through the Human Rights Act, however much it may have had an influence on my political career. But I do put it forward as an example of an international treaty that has brought in its wake intense disagreements as to its value. Any reasoned examination tells me that its impact has been profound and beneficial. Over the years, it's produced a number of landmark decisions which have challenged and halted practices which were once considered acceptable in Western democracies, but which would now be seen as wholly unacceptable by the overwhelming majority of the British public. And despite difficulties of the enforcement of some of its judgments, particularly in countries where the rule of law has previously been non-existent, the Strasbourg Court can show that it's been instrumental in bringing about positive changes of attitude by public authorities with a long track record of serial human rights violations. And since the Brighton Declaration of 2012, negotiated by my friend and colleague Ken Clark, with a bit of assistance from me, it's improved its processes, reduced its backlog of pending cases and unimplemented judgments, and engaged in a constructive dialogue with our own senior courts that is influencing its jurisprudence. On any showing, our support for the Convention and the Strasbourg Court has been a major achievement of British soft power on the international stage. Yet for all this, my party, which supported its creation and the later right of personal petition, is still calling for a review, with the possibility of replacing the Human Rights Act with a Bill of Rights that might call into question our future adherence to the Convention. Now, fortunately, I'm reasonably optimistic that this will not in fact happen. But it is symptomatic of the discomfort a supranational court causes and the continuing dislike by some of the effects of the Human Rights Act. It's noteworthy that other mainstream parties have at times been less than forthright in upholding the obligations the Convention imposes on us when it might need them to confront adverse, we might need to, to confront adverse public and media comment. Labour's long silence over resolving the issue of votes for some convicted prisoners arising out of the Hearst judgment was very telling. And it's welcome to be able to note that both the government and the Labour Party have shifted their position. It looks likely that this issue is now resolved. So it's with those thoughts in mind that I turn to the impact that the EU has had on human rights law. It's clear that in the way it's developed, EU law has influenced rights. The legal order under the EU treaties is of the greatest importance – 
since it provides the mechanism to ensure that the carefully agreed rules governing the interaction of nation states and European bodies are respected. As the product of an international treaty, the EU can only be effective and be seen to be legitimate if its own operations are considered to respect the letter and spirit of the treaties that created it. Furthermore, the very ambitious nature of the project has produced a requirement not only for there to be the primacy of EU law over the national law of its member states in areas of EU competence, but also the creation of parts of that law by its central bodies without the need for any domestically generated primary or secondary legislation at all in some cases. It's obvious that such a source of law could operate abusively, whatever the good intentions of its creators might be. The EU's member states clearly wish that EU law should further principles of democracy and the rule of law and values found in the constitutional traditions common to the member states, including those principles reflected in the European Convention on Human Rights and other international treaties on social and economic rights to which all members are signatories, as set out in the preamble to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But those general principles, therefore, need protecting. This is why they're now in the text in the Charter, which also covers the key obligations of member states in respect to the four freedoms conferred on EU citizens in the treaties. It does seem to me, therefore, to be rather ironic that the Charter should have been on the receiving end of so much vilification in the United Kingdom. Now, I can see that criticism can be made of its use to claim rights that might be considered to fall outside of the scope of the treaties altogether. I experienced this as Attorney General when I appeared in the Supreme Court for the government in Chester and McGeoch in 2013, where an attempt was made to use the Charter to claim prisoner voting rights in EU elections. It's, however, noteworthy that this attempt failed. One can also see that the Court of Justice of the European Union may be accused at times of misapplying rights under the Charter through a defect in factual reasoning and perhaps an insufficient regard for the intention of the signatories. The case of Telesweg and Watson on Article 8 of the Charter on Data Retention is such an example. But the critics of the Charter's existence seem to me to ignore the point that without it and the general principles of EU law it embodies, the risk would have been very much greater of seeing EU law being created or applied in a way that didn't respect the limits of the treaties or interfered with fundamental rights and then left individuals and legal entities without any means of redress. But recognition of these benefits has been lost in the repeated denunciation of the Charter as an alien document intent on imposing a form of written constitution on us contrary to our principles of parliamentary sovereignty. Yet on a practical level, however, the impact of general principles of EU law on our country does appear to me to be rather different. It's been the principal driver in recent years in promoting the development of equality law and social rights. For example, it's due to EU law in Article 21 of the Charter that there are rights to protection against pregnancy discrimination, equal pay for work of equal value, protection against discrimination at work on grounds of sexual orientation, religion and age. The Equality Act 2010 <coughs> may be a piece of parliamentary domestic legislation that would have been supported nationally in any event, but it owes its origins to changes brought about by EU law. In Northern Ireland, the lack of an Equality Act means that equality's protections are even more a direct result of EU membership. And it's noteworthy that despite some expressions of concern on the burden on business, there's never been any serious resistance to these developments. And of course, it's still happening. In the recent Supreme Court decision of Walker and Innerspec, Mr Walker relied on a framework directive interpreted in line with general principles of EU law of non-discrimination to disapply a provision of national law which restricted the extent to which same-sex spouses could receive pension payments from pensions earned by their deceased spouse. To political level, I have not heard one word of criticism about this decision. <laughs>
Despite my earlier comments, it's also clear that another area of importance is privacy law. Article 8 protects personal data, and in the matter of David Davis and Tom Watson's challenge to the data retention and Investigatory Powers Act 2014, the Court of Appeal agreed with the Divisional Court that Article 8 of the Charter was more specific than Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. My own opinion that the final decision of the Court of Justice of the European Union is deficient in its reasoning doesn't diminish the importance of this right. In Google and Vidal Hall, directive was interpreted in line with general principles of EU law. The ECHR and the Charter so as to require the payment of compensation for breaches of privacy, even when these breaches could not be shown to have given rise to a pecuniary harm. As the UK legislation implementing the directive could not be interpreted in line with it, the provision restricting compensation to pecuniary loss was disapplied. Again, the overwhelming impression I have of public reaction to this outcome that it was positive, unless one perhaps excludes the self-serving response of some sections of the media. I also can't overlook the recent decision in Benkhabush in the Supreme Court, held unanimously that two provisions of the State Immunity Act 78, inconsistent with Article 6 of the ECHR, interestingly on the basis that those provisions went beyond what was required to give state immunity under customary international law proper force. Ms. Benkabush's claim for the failure of her employers to comply with employment law ought therefore to proceed, but the ability for this to happen rested on the ability to disapply the legislation immediately because it also breached Article 47 of the Charter. Otherwise, the court would have been left with simply making a declaration of incompatibility. And here again, I just have never heard from any of my Conservative colleagues at Westminster a squeak of opposition to this decision or the fact that EU law has overridden a statute that appears on the court's reasoning to have been unnecessarily restrictive in relation to our obligations under international law. Finally, in this brief survey, the Charters helped guide the legislative process to ensure that areas like workers' rights in Article 27 are kept in mind when the law is changed. The same applies to environmental protection. Uh, it's like 27, uh, environmental protection in Article 37 and consumer protection in Article 38. Of course, I have to accept that there are some of my colleagues in Parliament who take the view that at most, the only human rights that should be protected are those in the Convention. And even then, some wish any rights protection to be purely domestic and not subject to any international treaty obligation at all. The Cross-Party Commission on the Bill of Rights, set up by the Coalition Government in 2010, highlighted not to my surprise, substantial philosophical difference on what constitutes human and fundamental rights that merit special protection. There may be an important jurisprudential distinction to be drawn between liberties and rights. And as a Conservative, I've always been a bit cautious about the ability to widen the scope of fundamental rights and some economic and social rights place positive duties on the state that may in theory be important aspirations, but can in practice be very hard to fulfil and involve a difficult and perhaps not readily justiciable balance between competing policy areas. We ought to be careful to ensure that law is not allowed to intrude too far into the realm of legitimate political choices. But that said, it's clear that there's grown up in the last half century Areas of law, particularly around equality and privacy, workers' rights and consumer protection, that are not well covered by the Convention and are seen as fundamental rights by an overwhelming section of the public. So much so, indeed, that the present government has been at great pains to emphasise that in leaving the EU, it's not its intention to diminish any of these rights currently enjoyed by UK nationals through the ACCI. The problem, however, is that the approach of the government as set out in the EU withdrawal bill really does suggest something rather <coughs> different. Having just spent four months considering the EU withdrawal bill, I have to start by applauding the skills of the parliamentary draftsmen and women who put it together. I don't think I've ever seen a piece of legislation that conferred such power on the executive to change the law of the land by statutory instrument and where the entire structure was so closely interwoven that the same end could often be achieved by wholly different routes. 
The bill proposes to take a snapshot of EU law as it stands on exit day and import it into our law. Thus, EU directives implemented by either primary or secondary legislation, to be known as EU-derived domestic legislation in Clause 2, EU regulations referred to as direct EU legislation, Clause 3, and directly affected provisions of EU law, Clause 4, are all to be retained in so far as not replaced by primary UK legislation on matters such as immigration, trade, customs, agriculture and fisheries that the government intends to enact before exit day. But at the same time, the government is then excluding the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is not to be part of domestic law after exit day. Nevertheless, allowing general principles of EU law to survive along with the ability to make continued reference to the Charter, but only in so far as it's necessary to interpret the retained EU law. The principle of supremacy of EU law is going to continue post-exit day as regards laws enacted prior to exit day or modified after exit day where that modification clearly intends to preserve the supremacy. But Schedule 1, paragraph 3.1 makes clear that from exit day on there will be no right of action in domestic law for any failure to comply with any of the general principles of EU law. Those general principles are not defined. Paragraph 3.2 then states that after exit day, I quote, no court may disapply, quash or decide that action is unlawful because it is incompatible with general principles of EU law. So the government intends to reduce both the charter and the general principles of EU law to no more than interpretative aids to retained EU law. The protective rights previously provided to challenge any abuse arising from the operation of EU law evaporate, leaving only the possibility of a challenge under the Human Rights Act if the protections are covered by the Convention. From speaking to ministers and looking at government statements, the justification tendered for this is that it would be wrong as we're leaving the EU, to allow any element of judicial supremacy inherent in the way EU law is operated to survive, as it offends the parliamentary sovereignty we're supposed to have lost and are now restoring. The alternative possibility of allowing our own Supreme Court to fulfil this role after exit has been dismissed. It's the anomaly of the result that bothers me one of the principal complaints about EU law is that it was either forced on Parliament, which had been obliged to enact statutes or statutory instruments as necessary to meet the EU's requirements, or worse still, it's been directly imposed on us by the Commission, acting on the authority we surrendered to the EU in the treaties. Furthermore, to try to maintain predictability, we have, as I've just mentioned, preserving its supremacy in relation to pre-exit enacted primary domestic legislation. More remarkably still, we're going to treat all direct EU legislation as primary for the purpose of the Human Rights Act, see Schedule 8, even though a lot of it, quite frankly, has the character of secondary legislation and is very much technical. I think I'm right in saying, somebody will correct me, I've found 615 implementing regulations in the area of the environment, consumers and health protection alone. Implementing regulations are made by the EU Commission using delegated authority to enact EU measures and can therefore be argued to be similar to secondary legislation in the United Kingdom. Paragraph 19 of Schedule 8 has the consequence that at most such implementing regulations can be subject only to a declaration of incompatibility if they were to be in breach of uh, the Human Rights Act. It may be many years indeed before it's all replaced with new domestic laws. In the meantime, those subject to retained law are going to have very limited means to challenge it. In a remarkable arrogation of power, paragraph 12b of Schedule 1 leaves open the possible creation of a right to challenge retained EU law for being invalid at the date of exit, but only if the challenge is, I quote, of a kind described or provided for in regulations made by a Minister of the Crown. I don't think I can actually think of any other example of a legal right being created or denied in such a fashion by the executive. 
And while this is all being sanctioned by Parliament in the withdrawal bill itself, the immense scope of the bill, as you will have seen as it went through the House of Commons, doesn't actually provide a great deal of reassurance that its full effect of this importation of law and turning it into retained EU law has in fact been considered. Indeed, bluntly speaking, it would have been completely impossible to do it. As has been commented on, the bill also provides for some of the most extensive Henry VIII powers to change primary legislation. This may be inevitable in order to bring Brexit about within the time constraints under which we're operating. And there are sunset clauses for the use of statutory instruments. But it does mean that important primary legislation, such as for example, again, the Equality Act, could be amended <coughs> by this method within the permitted period. And then there was Clause 9, which before we amended it in the Commons, as a result of my amendment, allowed the government to start enacting statutory instruments to take us out of the EU in furtherance of a withdrawal agreement, even before we actually knew what it is, even changing, if necessary, any other part of the withdrawal bill itself to do so. The same features can be seen in other legislation linked to Brexit. The trade bill and taxation cross-border trade bill all propose to hand large amounts of unaccountable lawmaking power to the executive on exactly the same justification. Taken together, they constitute, in my view, an undermining of the rule of law because they substitute executive discretion on questions of legal right and liability, rather than enacting and defining in law the criteria for resolving questions of how the law should be interpreted thereafter. The complexity of what's being attempted creates uncertainty as to how the law will operate. That may bring the legal professions a lot of work, but it's not exactly what Lord Bingham recommended in his first principle, that the law must be accessible and so far as possible intelligible, clear and predictable. One area in particular looks problematical. It really isn't clear to me and has not been since, since this started whether the continuing supremacy of retained EU law post-exit allows for quashing of pre-exit domestic legislation, nor what particular weight should be given to post-exit CJEU authorities by our own courts, assuming an intention by the government to mirror areas of EU law to maintain compatibility, which seems to be the hot topic because the government keeps on talking about that at the moment as part of our negotiating strategy. If such an agreement is reached, it may well be that a whole new set of rules will be required. And I don't find it surprising that members of the senior judiciary have expressed some concern over having to make rulings on issues that may have great political sensitivity as well as economic consequences if the choice facing a court is between regulatory consistency or divergence in an area of trade between the United Kingdom and our previous partners. Now, those are the matters on which debate in Parliament have been focused. Apart from the debate defeat on Clause 9, the government listened to some of the concerns around Henry VIII powers, certainly in respect of de remedying deficiencies in Clause 7. It agreed a sifting mechanism for deciding if statutory instruments made under the bill should be dealt with by affirmative or negative procedure. It's promised to revisit the issue of legal certainty <coughs> when the bill goes through the Lords. But I was disappointed that it wasn't able to do more to persuade the government to move further, at least allow challenges to the operation of retained EU law to be brought if it was in breach of general principles of EU law. I saw this, I should emphasise, not as a final way of resolving the problem, but as a stopgap following the removal of the right to do this under the Charter. It be interesting to see what happens to this when the bill is considered further by the House of Lords. The EU has been both an important source of law and also an important field of legal cooperation for us during the course of our membership. It's helped to develop and promote the rule of law for our own benefit and, of course, that of our fellow member states. Our departure leaves a lot of unresolved issues as to how that cooperation can be maintained. It's noteworthy in this context that the Prime Minister has recognised the importance for us, as well as for the EU, of continuing to participate in areas of justice and home affairs, including the European Arrest Warrant, 
the Schengen information system needed to support law enforcement cooperation across the EU. Also, the agreements, such as those to manage asylum applications contained in the Dublin framework, which have underpinned attempts at creating some order in what is, in fact, a very complex and difficult field, actually enabled us to return a significant number of asylum seekers to other EU countries. Equally important are the civil law measures, which include matters as diverse as high-value commercial litigation, contact arrangements for children. The recast Brussels regulations have created rules to ensure uniformity and certainty for litigating parties, including the mutual recognition of judgments and their enforceability in member states, including the use of injunctions. All this has been of the greatest benefit in making the United Kingdom an attractive place to litigate. The government's position towards some of these latter measures appears to be somewhat ambivalent, as it's been suggesting it may ask for new arrangements for our participation in substitution for the present ones. But generally, the government's intention is of wanting to remain in these type of arrangements after Brexit. And the possibility of doing this is reinforced by the fact that other non-EU states have been able to participate in some of them. It's arguably very much in the interest of the EU that we should continue to do so. But of course, we're going to do it as associates or observers. Our ability to shape the continuing development of these laws and frameworks is going to be reduced. All in fields of cooperation, where our well-established rule of law tradition means that we have hitherto been able to be principal leaders on them. We're going to be rule takers, not rule makers. And I really do see this as one of the most serious side effects of Brexit. As an example, we've rightly indicated our concern about how EU data sharing law is developing. We're enacting primary legislation to give effect to the new general data protection regulations of the EU, to which we provided input in our data protection bill. Well, what's going to happen once we're outside the EU in respect of our ability to contribute to further changes? It'll be gone, although we'll still be required to observe those changes in all data exchanges with EU countries, and ultimately, horror of horrors, for some of my colleagues, though they may not have realised this, it's going to be the Court of Justice of the European Union that will in practice determine what is permissible and what is not and although the EU may be secondary to the role played by the Council of Europe in promoting human rights more generally on our continent, its role has actually been substantial. The EU Fundamental Rights Agency, founded in 2007, works to promote human rights within the EU, playing an important role in member states where democracy and the rule of law are still newly established. It's extensively used United Kingdom NGOs and institutions to help it with its work. The Balance of Competences Review, carried out in 2014 by the then government, described the agency's output as accurate and of good quality. But after Brexit, we will no longer be able to play any formal role in its work. A useful element of UK soft power projection in promoting human rights will be lost. So will our ability to use our EU membership for the promotion of human rights and the rule of law outside the EU. It's easy to overlook the EU's role in doing this, but it has had considerable leverage. Council Regulation 1236-2005 banned the export of instruments of torture and is now extended to death penalty drugs. Negotiations of trade deals with third countries have included provisions requiring human rights issues to be addressed. Turkey's abolition of its death penalty in 2004 was a requirement for the conclusion of its engagement with the European Union in deepening relations with a view to possible eventual membership. So at the inevitable risk of being characterised as a Ramona, I'm afraid that the analysis I've tried to carry out of the consequences of Brexit on human rights law doesn't make me enthusiastic for its alleged benefits. There may be a bright economic future for us somewhere outside the EU, but in terms of the development of our law and the maintenance of the rule of law, both here and abroad, it is a revolutionary event, the creator not of some new order, but a potential chaos which the convolutions and oddities of the EU withdrawal bill 
only serve to emphasise. It's a profoundly unconservative act. For those ideological purists who are convinced that our laws will be improved by the removal of 45 years of foreign and newfangled accretions, I think there will be disappointment. The ghost of those accretions will be poltergeists lurking around to haunt them with random and unpleasant consequences for many years, and the substantial legal benefits that have come from them for the majority of citizens risk being diminished or lost in uncertainty. Nor do I think this will be the end of the matter. The reality is that over the years of our EU membership, we've inevitably acted as an EU level on matters which would otherwise have featured as part of a domestic national conversation in any event. It may be EU membership that has entrenched certain equality, privacy and social rights in our country to the disgust of believers in untrammeled parliamentary sovereignty, but might this not have happened anyway? It's true that in the Human Rights Act we proceeded with respect for our constitutional traditions in deciding on the mechanism of declarations of incompatibility rather than creating strike-down powers. But the idea that in 2017 we should now relegate EU-derived rights to a wholly unprotected status flies in the face of evolutionary change in human society. Doubtless, any of our forebears who frequented the court of King Henry VIII might have been surprised and appalled if they'd seen an advanced copy of the Bill of Rights of 1689. But that doesn't mean that their descendants in 1689 got it wrong. It must at least be possible, therefore, that our departure from the EU, the loss of the entrenched protections it entails, is going to lead to a debate on how we go forward. The proposal of a domestic Bill of Rights with protections additional to the Human Rights Act, which could adequately cover equality and privacy laws, might help address the issue. Doubtless, this debate will have opposite poles. Those resolutely oppo uh, 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 opposed to any laws enjoying a special status and those for whom the Charter of Fundamental Rights was the first step <coughs> to an overarching architecture of entrenchment of fundamental rights and judicial supremacy in their application. As I've said, as a Conservative, this latter view isn't mine. But I really am concerned that some of my colleagues in Parliament haven't even noticed the existence of this lobby or the extent to which such rights have become accepted by the public as of importance, even if the public have had no reason to consider their origin or how they have been secured. As Brexit proceeds, this debate will not be confined to Westminster. The return of powers from the devolved administrations to Whitehall and Westminster provided for in clauses 10, 11 and Schedule 2 of the Bill is, as we all know, <coughs> a source of political controversy because of the way Clause 11 prevents the devolved legislatures act acting any laws thereafter to modify retained EU law, even if it falls within their devolved areas of competence. Equal opportunities, except in Northern Ireland and data protection, have always been reserved matters. But there's no doubt the Scottish Government and the Welsh Assembly Government have shown no hostility to rights entrenched by EU membership. Indeed, on one view of the devolution settlements of Wales and Scotland is that human rights are a devolved matter and Wales has incorporated the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into its domestic law through the Rights of Children and Young Persons Wales Measure 2011. In the Northern Ireland context, we continue to have the unresolved issue of implementing a special Bill of Rights additional to the Human Rights Act that was provided for in the Good Friday Agreement but has never been carried forward, and now the Good Friday Agreement, quite incredibly, appears to be under threat as well. <coughs> All these issues are likely to have a bearing on any debate on EU-derived rights and the removal of protection from them as we leave, and I really wouldn't wish to speculate as to where it will all end up. Taking back control is undoubtedly a powerful idea in conditions where the decline in general confidence in institutions, both national and supranational, has become so marked. But in an increasingly interdependent world, what constitutes the benefit of exclusive control becomes harder and harder to identify. The risk is that it's all largely a mirage. 
that leaves individuals in practice fewer opportunities to enjoy a good quality of life or to obtain redress for administrative failings. It's also a uniquely disruptive form of change that precipitates the very reverse of quiet government, which the Book of Common Prayer has long enjoined us to pray for and which the United Kingdom has traditionally aspired to deliver to its citizens. The principal short-term beneficiary of this is the executive, as a result of its accruing more power in response to the disruption. Those of us who believe that a lively, free and therefore successful democratic society thrives on checks and balances are just going to have to work hard to ensure that we protect and preserve a legacy of international cooperation and engagement that has done all of us in this country very little harm and undoubtedly a great deal of good. Thank you very much.